cash. Close, close, a little high. 15. I just saw where a four minute mile was beaten by a couple of hours. Car, uh, high school boys last year. <coughs> yeah. Four minute mile, yeah. So 100 meter dash, world record 9.58 seconds. 100 meters. That was set by Usain Bolt back in 2009. Almost, yeah, for pushing 20 years old. Um, so that means he reached top speed of about 23 miles an hour. Right. Running with his feet. With his feet. That's fast. That's fast. He's about three times faster than the average person. So, so why, why am I giving you a useful trivia about running? Well, my experience is that we all run. We all have a tendency to run. As a child, I attempted to run away from home. Anybody do that as a kid? No way. So it was just me, I guess. Um, so I, I'm about eight, nine years old. I got it in my head that, I don't know for what reason, I was like, I am going to leave this place and never come back. So I, mean, I don't even, I can't remember the specifics of why I decided to run something super impactful for an eight year old, decided to, you know, take root in my life and say, you know what, you're gonna leave and you're never gonna come back. It was awful, I probably got told no for something. Um, so I plotted and I packed my bag and I had a plan. I was gonna wait, I had a single level house we lived in, I was gonna wait until everyone went to sleep I was gonna open my window, toss my bag out, climb out. And then I was going to go down the street and live in the creek. Because we had a creek. And uh, we played down there a lot and we dug holes into the side of the bank and knocked us a very, very tall bank. So I was like, I can build a house there and I could just live there by myself at eight years old because it was better than being in my house. Which, to give you a little uh, background, my, house, my household was a good house to live in. I had loving parents, Christian parents. It wasn't as bad as my eight-year-old mind made it out to be. But I had that plan, that was my plan. And when the time came to it, I never went. Because I could never wake up in the middle of the night. I always fell asleep. So I gave up on that. But more seriously, on a, on a different note, um, even in my own personal life, so when I, um, you know, Growing up, I, I had this, this feeling of a call on my life, and um, so I invested some time and effort into developing that, and then um, became licensed with the network back in 2014, and started that process of what it looked like to move into ministry, whatever that looks like. And then um, I went through some, some good times and some not so great times um, at uh, a, ch a church that I was at for a short period of time, and um, I felt very very hurt and damaged by some of the things that happened. So then I ended up going to um, a church where I could heal and kind of, you know, kind of take care of myself a little bit. And um, it, was, it was a great time of rest and recovery for myself, to restore myself. Um, except uh, during that time period, um, so when you are credentialed with the network, one thing every year, they have you renew your credentials, okay? You have a questionnaire, <laughs> and all this other fun stuff just to make sure that you're still on par with the network, okay? One of the questions on there is that if you were, it asks if you're engaged in um, active ministry of proclaiming the word, teaching the gospel for the whole calendar year, and for a, a, that, that year that they were asking about, I actually had just been attending church so I didn't preach, I didn't do anything, I just kind of sat. Um, and something told me, well, you didn't do anything for that year, so therefore you have to answer no and not renew your credentials. So I let my credentials lapse. Um, because I told, so I told myself that I wasn't doing the job. That I wasn't worthy of the call that was on. So I decided to let it lapse and just do what I'd been doing. And, uh, you know, I ran from what God had for me. 
and it was other people in my my life that uh, you know just kind of beat me over the head a little bit consistently, saying, "What are you doing? What are you doing? You know this isn't right." And then I had you know got my head on straight, and then uh, got my credentials reinstated, which is a whole process and a whole bunch of heartache that I didn't want to have to go through. But I made the choice, so I had to do it, and. Um, so then I've been credentialed since, you know, for the last few years, re-credentialed. Um, but I mentioned that we all have a tendency to run. Can you now think of a time, uh, this, is, this is not a show and tell time, but can you think of a time that you have run from something? Maybe you're still running from this something. You know, it could have been a mistake that was made running from the consequences of it. Maybe we run from somebody that we hurt or somebody that hurt us. Maybe it's an obligation that we don't want to fulfill. Something we said we were going to do and now we're trying to escape it because we just really don't want to do it. Maybe it's a family member that's less than easy to deal with. Maybe, maybe we're running from a call that God has so today what we're going to talk about, the main, like if we were to boil it down to like one main point, so we're going to do a one point message with several sub points, we'll be out by four o'clock at the latest. Um, so the, the main point is that in the midst of our running, God makes a way back to restoration. And the Bible is full of examples of runners, full of examples. Yeah, Adam and Eve, they tried to elude God and hide from him, run from him. You got Jacob, who ran from his brother. You got Moses, who, who fled Egypt the first time. You got David, who ran from Saul. And we got so many more other examples that we could pull. But we see consistently in these biblical examples of those that run from something, from someone, that they can't escape being brought back to what they're running from. Adam and Eve had to face God. They tried to run from him, they had to face him. Jacob tried to run from his brother Esau and got confronted with his brother Esau in a way he didn't want to do it. Moses ran from Egypt, and what did God do? Sent him back to Egypt. David ran from Saul, he still had to confront Saul. David, though, was a very effective runner. He ran from Saul for like eight years. So that's a, that's a good example of running. But, um, so the difference is how they faced what they, what, how they ended up facing what they were running from. So today we're going to look at a, a different runner out of the Bible. His name is Onesimus. Everyone said, "Oh yes, of course, of course, Onesimus. Of course, everyone knows who he is, right?" No, okay. <laughs> uh, we find him in the Book of Philemon, or Philemon for those who pronounce it differently. So that is where our uh, text is going to sit for today is in the, the entirety of the book of Philemon. Good thing it's only one chapter. It's about 20, 25, 27 verses. We're not going to read the entire thing of it. But as we read through it, I want to note three important things that um, we see in this letter. So a little bit of background is that Philemon, the, the book of Philemon, was written by Paul to Philemon. It was titled Philemon because that's who he wrote it to. This was a let, he, Philemon was a member of the Church of Colossus. And Philemon owned a slave, Onesimus, and that slave had run away from him. So Paul is actually sending this letter to Philemon with Onesimus back to Philemon. One thing that we see in the first few verses, we'll read that in a moment, says that Paul show, we see that Paul shows respect to Philemon. When we see in verse 1, it says, This letter is from Paul, a prisoner for preaching the good news about Jesus Christ, and from our brother Timothy. I am writing to Philemon, our beloved co-worker, and to our sister, Aphia, and to our fellow soldier, Archippus, and to the church that meets in your house. May God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. I always thank my God when I pray for you, Philemon, because I keep hearing about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people. And I am praying that you put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. Your love has given me much joy and comfort, my brother, for your kindness has often refreshed the hearts of God's people. 
That is why I am boldly asking a favor of you. I could demand it in the name of Christ because it is the right thing for you to do. But because, our, because of our love, I prefer simply to ask you. Consider this as a request from me, Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner for the sake of Christ Jesus. So we see in this opening to this letter that Paul just pours the love on him. He just, he just kind of just pours in all the great things that he appreciates about him, the, the, the good attributes that Philemon has. He also includes Philemon's wife. That's Aphia in the beginning. That's Philemon's wife. And this is important because Paul recognizes the importance of addressing it not only to Philemon, the head of the household, but to Aphia, his wife, because in the, the Roman era where this took place, AD 60, <coughs> um, the wife was actually responsible for the daily, res the daily responsibilities of household slaves. So household slaves fell under the purview of the wife. So this whole letter of sending back a slave not only is to Philemon to address that, but also to his wife because she's a major decision maker in this situation. So he, Paul understood that his letter, the content of his letter, the ask that he was going to be asking Philemon to do was going to be difficult for him to process and to act on. So he took his time to highlight the good that he saw in Philemon. <coughs> Paul had some apostolic authority, given, his, given who Paul was. He had the authority to require Philemon to do what was right. Right? But he wanted Philemon to come to this conclusion on his own. He wanted him to act on under his own desires to do what was right, not just because he was required to do what was right. I think that's really important, especially in today's church. A lot of times we focus on, this is what's right, so therefore you have to do it. I think it's really important that we, we encourage one another to get to that conclusion on our own. Mm -hmm. you know? And Paul was very conscientious, because he because Paul knew what was right, but Philemon was a slave, slave owner, which was culturally normal back then. So he knew Philemon had growth to have. There was something that he needed to change in his personal life and attitude to line up with what Christ had, his teaching. So Paul knew this, but he didn't force him to do what was right. He said, listen, I want you to grow. I want you to personally come to this conclusion so that you will do the right thing because you want to. And I think that's, I think that's very applicable to <coughs> us today. A lot of times I feel like I see it happen in churches where we try to strong arm each other. The Bible says you can't do this, this, and this, so therefore you need to give up these things. And it's it, it's not that it's wrong to, to that. It's not that it's wrong. It's that we are strong arming people into doing what's right rather than guiding them along and saying, hey, let's educate you. Let's get you closer to Christ and see what happens. Because Christ will, make, will change their mind for you. It's not our job to make them do what's right. It's our job to help facilitate the journey. Amen. And that's what Paul was doing. He was facilitating the journey for Philemon. The next thing that we see in this is that Paul compelled Philemon to remove barriers. So verse 10 says, I appeal to you to show kindness to my child Onesimus. I became his father in the faith while here in prison. Onesimus hasn't been much of hasn't been of much use to you in the past, but now he is very useful for, to both of us. I am sending him back to you, and with him comes my own heart. I wanted to keep him here with me while I am in these chains for preaching the good news, and he would have helped me on your behalf. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent. I wanted you to help because you were willing, not because you were forced. So Paul was at a bit of a disadvantage in this situation. Uh, Paul was under arrest. He couldn't. He was not considered a free man at this point, and that is important because a free man in the in the Roman world could have found a runaway slave, which is Anisimus, could have found a runaway slave. He could have legally taken temporary ownership of him to bring him back. But Paul was unable to do that because he was under under arrest. So Paul has to. Because in person, Paul could have definitely made a very good case with Philemon. Hey, I brought him back to you. This is what you should be doing because of who you're following. This is how it should go. Paul would have made a very strong case in person. But he had to rely on 
the power of this letter and the grace of God to get this message through. The culture that these two men lived in dictated a certain type of response to runaway slaves. Um, wasn't typically good response. Uh, runaway slaves were commonly beaten, sometimes to death, but if they didn't get beaten to death by whoever found them or their owner, the owner would usually task them with a job or responsibility that would ensure them a very short life. That was normal. That was a normal punishment for a runaway slave. Paul was very strategic in asking Philemon to forgo the norms of culture and forgive him of his wrongdoing. The barrier that Paul took down, Paul was attempting to take down that wanted Philemon to remove, is the barrier of slavery, which is a huge barrier. I think we would agree. It's a barrier between people. It changes that, that perspective because a slave, even back then, even though slaves were treated fairly okay in most situations, uh, they were still a low class of person. There was a huge deviation between an average person and a slave. So Paul is compelling Philemon to remove that cultural barrier to be able to bring Philemon back. Bring Onesimus back, sorry. So the question with this that I would, I would pose, that it kind of popped into my head as I was, I was studying this, is how often do we let culture dictate how we handle certain situations? cultural norms that we live in, how often do those dictate decisions that we make, situations that we handle? Pretty frequently, I would, I would, I would say, from my own experience, I don't know how you find people, but um, I would say that culture typically dictates a lot when we make decisions. But, quick sidebar, we'll jump right back in. When it comes to culture, so um, at my church right now, we're doing a, a Wednesday night Bible study. It's a video series by Andy Stanley. Has anybody ever heard of Andy Stanley? Relatively good speaker. I like him a lot. Um, we're doing a series on wisdom and asking the question, honestly, of ourselves, what is the wise thing for me to do right now based off of like past experiences, current circumstances, and future hopes and dreams? What is the wise thing for me to do? And one of the things that Andy talks about in this study so strongly is that in today's culture, if you just pick your feet up and let culture take you where culture goes, you're going to end up in a place that you don't want to be in. You're going to end up in a financial position you don't want to be in, in a relationship you don't want to be in, in, a, in, in many different situations that would just, if you had the choice, you would not want. So I think that, and I think that, that piggybacks on this with these cultural barriers that separate people. Culture should not dictate how we operate as Christians. One more time. Culture should not dictate how we operate as Christians. Amen. Okay? Amen. Got a couple of people, so I'll take it. Yeah. Barriers create, create division. The third thing that I'd like to know out of this passage is that Paul urged Philemon to forgive similarly to how Philemon was forgiven. So we see verse 15. It says, it seems you lost Onesimus for a little while so that you could have him back forever. He is no longer like a slave to you. He is more than a slave, for he is a beloved brother, especially to me. Now he will mean much more to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to me. Verse 19 is great because it's all caps, and it says, I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it, and I won't mention that you owe me your very soul. So this, this, this is all caps in here because Paul is actually writing a legal agreement to financially take the burden for any wrongdoing that Onesimus did to Philemon. And then Paul, of course, has to throw in that little bit that you know, he won't mention that Philemon owes him his very soul because Paul converted Philemon and brought him to Christ. So, you know, go, he, he gives, him, gives him, hey, I'm going to do this, and then he throws a little zinger in on the side there. And then verse 20 says, yes, my brother, please do me this favor for the Lord's sake. Give me this encouragement in Christ. I am confident as I write this letter that you will do what I ask and even more. So he puts that whole perspective of the situation into frame for Philemon. You know, he talks about you lost him for a little while, but now you've got him back forever. 
because Philemon had a, a slave abandoned him. He had a slave run away. But Paul is sending him back, not a slave, but he's sending him a brother. Amen. And um, that's a very that's a very hard ask of Paul, of Philemon. Culturally speaking, it's a hard ask. Um, and it, he doesn't say it black and white in the letter, but Paul very strongly implies that not only should he receive him and forgive him for running away, but he implies that he should free him as a slave, to not be a slave anymore, um, which is absolutely unheard of. Not necessarily a freeing a slave back in the Roman era, but specifically a runaway slave that the owner got back, freedom was not an option. But Paul urges him for that. He also shows, the, Paul also shows the love of Christ in his statement about pain for Onesimus' uh, whatever he took or any financial responsibility. Because we don't know if he took something from Philemon when he left. Most of the time they do steal something and leave. But Paul doesn't even know what Onesimus may or may not have taken. He, he blindly, in a way, accepts any responsibility. So you could almost say that he offers to take the burden for a sin that was committed to somebody else. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, yeah maybe. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> so in all this, in this whole story, we see that in the midst of Onesimus', Onesimus is running, that God made a way for him to be restored. So how can we see that God made a way for this runner? And how can he make a way for us? First thing that we see is that he puts people in our path. Onesimus runs from Philemon. Okay? As he runs, he just so happens to cross paths with Paul. That's a crazy coincidence, huh? Mm -hmm. Unless it's not a coincidence. But Paul was under arrest. He was under house arrest. How does a runaway slave accidentally run into somebody who's in house arrest? God puts him there. And this encounter that he has with Paul, the runaway slave, this encounter he has when he meets Paul, changes the trajectory, trajectory of his life forever. He ends up becoming a follower of Christ, and in the long term is reunited and restored with his former owner, Philemon, or current owner, technically. As we run from our problems, God puts people in our path to direct us towards it. So God directs us back to where we came from. When we're running from something, the people he puts in our pathway, just like for Onesimus, Paul had a good opportunity here to utilize Onesimus in ministry while Paul was in prison. That would have been a great use of somebody who just converted, right? Would there have been anything wrong with Paul utilizing him that way? I mean, doing the Lord's work, right? But instead, Paul understands that he needs to go back to Philemon. He needs to go back to what he was running from. Because I don't think that you can be effective in what God's called you to do. Doesn't mean you can't do it. I don't think you can be very effective if you're running from something. If you're not facing what you're running from. Amen. And it's important that we listen to the people that we put in our lives. The people that you know, the people in your circle of, of influence, your, your, your community, whether it's your community of church, your community of work, your community of where you live, your community of school, if you have, you know, if you have interactions at schools, your community of people are there for a reason. I think it's important that we are aware of the people that God puts in our lives. Because you never know when someone in your life is going to change the traje trajectory of your life. You know, I could think I could think of a handful of times where I have been grateful to meet somebody that I, I that wasn't in my plan, that wasn't in something I was gonna do. Um, and one person in particular, it was at a it was at a church service that I mean Full transparency here. Uh, sometimes I don't feel like going to church. 
They may have been in that situation. Amen. I mean, I'm just being honest with you guys. You know, even the pastor sometimes doesn't feel like going to, a, to an extra service, to a special event. Because life is busy, you know. I didn't want to go to a particular event. I went because my wife told me I had to go. So I went. I listened. I, I, I listened to the person that God paired me with for the rest of my life. And I had an encounter with the speaker there that I will never forget. That changed my whole perspective on what it means to be a Christian, what it means to follow God, what it means to minister to people. I don't know what kind of a life I would have if I didn't go to that event. These little things. And it kind of ties into that whole idea of wisdom. What's the wise thing for me to do? You know, it's not what's the right thing or the wrong thing or the easy thing or the fun thing. In that moment, I was opting for what's the easy thing to do, not go. And my wife reminded me that that is not the wise thing to do. And it paid off more than I could even imagine because I'm still in the middle of it. But not to discount yourself, we are also in somebody's circle of community. You are in somebody's community. <coughs> you are part of their life. <coughs> Has God placed you in their life to be a Paul, to redirect them? Because we have a tendency to run, I think God has placed many of, of, of interceptors to runners, to redirect, to send them back. Because I don't know, I don't know if you guys have experienced this. I've experienced it once or twice. It is way easier sometimes for me to talk with somebody and hear what they're going through and hear the issues that they have, and for me to go, "Wow, it is very." obvious to me that the, the right course of action is X. But in my own life, it's not that clear to me sometimes. <laughs> sometimes I need somebody else to say, hey, it seems pretty obvious you should be here. So don't discount your role in the people around you because you are a person placed in their pathway. Amen. That's right. Second thing that we can see that how God makes a way for runners he calls us to remove barriers. Paul called on Philemon to go against cultural norms and show love and forgiveness. The barrier that existed was slavery. It separated Onesimus and Philemon. Culture did not allow for that runaway slave to be forgiven or freed. It would have taken a lot of courage for Philemon to do as Paul asked, but Paul understood the importance of reconciliation and showing Christ's love. God calls all of us to remove any barrier that hinders forgiveness. Forgiveness is probably, like, we, we, can, we can talk all day about forgiveness and the importance of it and Amen. the difficulty of it and the necessity of it. But forgiveness is hard when there's a wall in the way. Forgiveness is impossible when there's a wall in the way. God calls on us that when we have the ability, for Philemon it was slavery, but for us, I would venture to say in most parts of the world it's not slavery. Well, most parts of the U.S. it's not slavery. Slavery is not our barrier to worry about. But it could be past hurts. That could be a barrier. Our pride can be a barrier. My favorite one, our personal rights. Our personal rights is a great one. Well, I deserve... What's, I'm owed this. I am owed that. I'm allowed to do this. It is my right to say this to that person. Those are barriers. Just because it's your right doesn't mean it is wise. Third thing that we see is that he forgives us at great cost. He, as in God, forgives us at great cost Amen. and calls us to do the same. So we can see in the example of Paul, he is so passionate about Onesimus being forgiven that he agrees, agrees to take on that unforeseen debt to ensure that he is forgiven. As Jesus took on great personal cost, 
I'm sure we know the story, to forgive us of the sins that we commit, Paul understands that we should be mirroring the same behavior. I love how Paul, he, Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Amen. Paul is a fantastic example of what it looks like to follow Christ. Like, we can follow Christ, and we can all figure out what that looks like for us. Paul did it and wrote about it. So we have a good example. Like, if we ever wonder, hey, I wonder if making this decision or doing this thing is going to be quite exactly what, what, what God would want me to do, you can look to Paul as a, a reflection still of what Christ did. As we are forgiven and continually are forgiven of our many failings, <coughs> my many failings, we should be eager to forgive our brothers and sisters in Christ for much less. But I will tell you that in the church, the church as a whole, not this church because just met you guys, but the church as a whole is not a forgiving place. It's not. It's a place where we hold grudges and where we hold people to a standard that we don't even want to think about. There is very little that another brother and sister in Christ could do to us that would even come close to what we did by sinning against God. Amen. We have been forgiven of so much, how could we be so petty to hold on to forgiveness for someone else? Philemon had to change how he viewed Onesimus after he returned looking for forgiveness. I believe that we also need to take, a, take some time and look at those that have hurt us and look at them differently. Look at them with love and compassion. Look at them with the eyes of Christ. Yes, they hurt us. They did something wrong. But, but, is it really that bad that it can't be forgiven? I'm sure I'm not the only one that has thought, wow, I have done this. There's no way God's going to forgive me again. There's no way. But he continues to forgive. He continues to love us. In spite of ourselves. Through our issues through our struggles, through our sin. And he calls us to do the same thing with each other. And the church in America, with some exceptions, is missing the mark. We need to do better. I need to do better. It's not easy because our personal feelings get in the way. Our desires for justice. So as we run, God makes ways for us to go back for restoration, Amen. to be restored. Amen. We all run from something. We have those that may run from us. What would it look like? Let's, let's put our thinking caps on and our imagination on for a second. What would it look like if we all provided a means of restoration for those around us like God does for us? What would, what, would, what would this church look like? What would this town look like? What would this state look like? If we all provided rest, a means of restoration for those that are running, just like God provides a means of restoration for those that run him, what relationships could be mended? What friends could be reclaimed? What kind of healing could be experienced? And how much more could the body be unified? As we see Paul follow Christ in this letter, let's remember to respect our family, Amen. the family of God. Even if we know what they should do, let's remove the borders we see preventing restoration. And let's foster an idea of forgiveness that reflects the forgiveness that we have received from God. Amen. Let's take a moment. Amen. We're going to close with some prayer. If you're able to, I encourage you to stand with me. And let us pray.
Dearly Father, we come before you, thankful for this time together, thankful for this uh, wonderful weather you've given us. Lord, we thank you for providing a way for us, even as we continually run from what you have for us. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, we ask that you would uh, bring us to a point of wanting to stop running. Stop running from you and turn towards you. Amen. Help us to see the path that you've laid before us. Help us to look for others who are also running, that we may be able to be an influence like Paul was to them and help direct them towards you, Thanks. to point them back to where they should come. Because just because we're, we're running and we're coming back to you doesn't mean we can't help other people along the way. Lord, we ask that you would be with us as we go through our, our day and our week. And just keep, keep it fresh in our minds and give us moments and give us interactions that, that show us the ways that you have made. That, provide, that, that provides us an opportunity to remove barriers for forgiveness. To forgive generously. And to respect where our fellow believers are in their Father, we ask these things in your name. 